Hey everyone, this is a Conquest tier list review. I'm Mecha, welcome. A long time ago, I had my Patreons on Patreon submit characters for me to rank in a tier list on the big tier list with all the Fire Emblem characters. And sometimes they would submit characters from the hit game Fire Emblem Fates and I, all around Fire Emblem expert that I am, would have to figure out where to put them based off of like one very scuffed hard slash normal mode playthrough. And this right here is the result of that. It's a very scuffed tier list based off of a scuffed playthrough. Uh, it probably has most people in kind of okay places, but there's a lot of embarrassing errors there. So today we're gonna break that list down and we're gonna start from scratch uh, and build it back up with two things that I didn't have back when I tiered those units. Uh, one is a little more experience, both playing and talking about Conquest, but the other is the help of someone with a lot more experience playing and talking about Conquest, and that is Zoran. So, Zoran, hello and welcome. Hi. How are um, you doing, Zoran? I'm doing all right. How about you? Mm. I'm fantastic. So, um, we haven't had you on here before, but I have a feeling that a lot of my viewers are familiar with your channel by now because, uh, well, for one, you have good videos and those tend to spread, and for two, I've plugged you a couple times. Uh, but for the couple that don't know, um, can you tell me what your channel is all about? Uh, yeah, it's mostly focused on uh, Fire Emblem content, um, and I have covered mainly, I think basically exclusively, the more recent Fire Emblem games. Um, so I've done some... I did an engage playthrough when it came out, uh, and I did a let's play of Three Houses a while back. But uh, the the main focus has been playing Conquest because it's my favorite game in the series, and I think there's a lot of cool things to do with it. Um, so I've done some kind of some sort of independent guides on different chapters, uh, some like mini series where I do challenges for parts of the game, and then the main series that I'm featuring now, which is about halfway through and will be finished eventually is uh, a, a challenge run of conquest where I'm trying to use uh, all 40 units, all 40 like regular named units in the game, which is, uh, it's been an interesting challenge. Uh, it's, I think it's really fun and it's cool that you can do that in this game. And it does give me um, some insight into like how every unit can be used and what what you really need to be successful in the game because I'm spreading my experience super thin and it's just difficult to juggle everything. Uh, but I will say uh, I'm trying not to rate things through that lens because it's a really stupid way to play the game, <laughs> to be honest. For sure, but I also know you have a lot of experience playing in other uh, ways, some of which could be considered efficient because the videos that I got hooked on when I first found your channel is the videos where you do, I think you call them demonstrations, where you're just showing things you can do in a chapter with units. I don't have a more flattering way to describe that. Like, and I should need, I need one. So uh, what are you trying to demonstrate to people usually? Like, is it how you can build a certain unit or how you can very easily beat a, beat a chapter or is it both? Uh, part of that, so I did a few that were, I was calling uh, like beating like X chapter the easy way, which was yeah, kind of like, um, Trying, like assuming that you did nothing special with your run, you didn't really engage with a lot of the reclassing mechanics or anything. You just had like a vanilla team, and what could you do with that to to beat a chapter that was infamous for its difficulty fairly easily? Um, and others were like to prove a point. <laughs> uh, uh, for example, um, I did a few videos back to back where either Odin or Ophelia or both of them got life and death in chapter 23. And that was mostly in response to people saying that like, oh, you need to like spam paralogs or like go out of your way and separate training missions to go build ridiculous um, builds that you can make in this game. Um, and I, I wanted to show that, no, you could pull it off in the main chapters and you could do it at something resembling like a, a fast pace in terms of turn count if you wanted to. Yeah. I feel like that quality right there is probably what makes you makes it so good that you're here to discuss this because this is roughly the pace that I think most people assume you need to adhere to to make a any kind of uh, reasonably efficient tier list or whatever. 
Hey, it's Editor Mecca here. At this point, we're going to start laying the foundation for the rules of this tier list in terms of pace of play, favoritism, what's allowed in my castle, and so on. I think this is important to discuss in advance so you know where we're coming from, and I think it's interesting. But I know you all came here for a tier list and unit discussion, so I totally understand if you want to skip ahead a bit, in which case you'll probably find some helpful timestamps below. But you also have... Um, I think you can also tell that you could pull this off in a lot slower, uh, in, in slower clears, like take one or two extra turns somewhere. Like I remember, for example, there's a chapter where you're, uh, you're fighting Iago and Hans, and you made a demonstration that like, hey, this is how you can do it the easy way, but I'm, I'm still going to go through it really fast. But if you wanted to, you can take a break here and regroup everyone. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's that's really the, the core of what efficiency is and what makes it so tough to define is like, yeah, you kind of have to assume you're going kind of fast to make sure that units are easy to distinguish from each other. But you don't want to go so fast that it goes away from how people generally play the game, because otherwise it's going to make the video kind of meaningless to a lot of people. Like, I want this to be a relatable kind of tier list. And that's why I want to give ourselves the time to um, talk about each of these units in a reasonable amount of depth to really explore what you can do at different paces. That's why there's only four and a half units on the menu right now, is I think we'll have plenty of time um, to dedicate to each of them to show you what they can do with them, especially with Corrin, who has like so many options. Uh, but before we get into that, I think there's a couple of baselines that would be good to establish. I feel like for Conquest specifically, there's a lot of things that you can do in the game that are feel kind of optional, uh, especially with regards to like online and my castle, that I think most people play it similarly, but if you had to like pin down an exact rule set, you have a very tough time. And I think you had a reasonable solution to that. Um, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. My, my perspective on it is, I, for, number one, I don't expect people, like least of all me, to beat the game in one sitting. Oh, thank God. Um, which, it, like, it's possible, certainly, but um, not the way I play. <laughs> uh, but one of the consequences of that is you're going to have downtime like between when you pick up the game when when the castle events can advance so like if you're plowing right through every chapter in a row in, in one sitting then the buildings in the in the in the castle particularly like the resources and some of the interactive buildings uh, will only reset every you know two three or four chapters so you're not going to get that much out of them but i think normally you're maybe playing two or three chapters and then taking a break and coming back later, maybe the next day or something. Um, and then you're going to be, you know, the, those buildings will, will reset and, um, and you'll be able to use them again. Now I don't consider some of the buildings at all. Like I, I'm not really interested in abusing the, the private quarters to get a bunch of free support ranks with Corin. And the lottery shop is a thing that exists and you should probably use if, if you've got it but there's no way for me to really account for uh, any weapons you might luck into, or maybe you get a, like a free heart seal or something early on. Yeah. Uh, which would be a big deal, but I, I can't factor that in. Um, although I do think it's worth noting that the lottery shop is one of your sources for other resources that your castle doesn't automatically come with, and you get them fairly frequently. So it's it's important for that reason. Um, but anyway, I I think my expectation with with the castle mechanics in particular is, um, I would say, assuming you're not just speed running the game, it's fairly easy to get at least one of each of the uh, the forging resources pretty quickly, so that if you want to forge up a plus one axe or bow or lance or dagger or whatever else you can manage at least that yeah and probably a couple of them fairly quickly um and then if you want a plus two that takes four resources instead of one um which is not as trivial but it's you can do it fairly easily for whichever resource your castle has and if you have to you can convert stuff to make that happen for like one other weapon type fairly easily yeah but it's a, there's an opportunity cost to it because you still have to dedicate a lot of resources to making that plus two happen, whereas the plus ones are basically free then, right? Yeah, it's it's like making a plus two is not trivial, and going beyond that, 
is a pretty significant burden, except maybe for whichever gem type your castle happens to have. Um, so I, I don't expect to have more than a plus two of anything, really. Yeah, and I feel like that extends nicely to most other resources in Conquest, where it's like, the more you need, the worse it is. So if you're really good, because like, in Conquest, that's the main reason we're discussing this, is that everyone in Conquest, almost every unit is really good. I I don't even know if I'm going to need this D tier, <laughs> to be honest. So I'm, I mean, I, I think there's enough of a spread within the world of Conquest for that to make some amount of sense. Mm -hmm. But if you were putting this into your big tier list, mm -hmm. uh, Basically, everyone in the cast is at least pretty good. So I, I don't think anyone in, in Conquest comes even close to some of the the low tiers you see in, in other games. Oh, that's fair. I'll have to think about how I integrate that, but that's a problem for future mecha. Yes. All right. So in that case, uh, there, there's probably more to define, but they probably make a lot more sense when we're discussing them in the context of actual units. So uh, I guess we can start yeah. with the... If you're good to start too, that is. Uh. I, I think I just want to mention, as far as other castle and multiplayer features mm -hmm. and online, um, I'm not expecting that you would be going to other castles and harvesting resources. Um, honestly, I, I prefer playing in a world where you don't have to worry about which particular resource you have, but I know not everyone can do that. Um, and as far as DLC goes, I'm not including any of it, even though there are a couple of free DLCs that if you downloaded from the the, the eShop when it was available, uh, you, yeah, you just have uh, boots and a Paragon scroll and a free Ballistician's whatever it's mark, <laughs> Ballistician's mark, or is that what it was called? Sighting, oh, sighting lens and witch's mark, um, one or the other. So you could have a witch, and that would be, depending who you use it on, ridiculously broken. Yeah, no. I'm not. I'm not going to use those. <laughs> no witches, <laughs> I'm afraid. They can teleport in an attack or something, right? Uh, yeah, they their version of warp lets them teleport to a teammate. Oh, right. Um, I think I've I've seen those and, before. And act. They they do not seem like uh, they have a place in this. I'm afraid. Yeah. It's uh, that's for something else. Okay. And uh, but everything else I think might work in the context of units because this is all this is all very theoretical so far. I'd like to get into tiering units if you're ready. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. So. Um, I think Corn might be the hardest units to tier. Well, not the hardest units to tier, but the hardest units to even fit into the puzzle because they can be just about anything. I remember when I first played Conquest, I was like, well, this unit is kind of okay, but I didn't heart seal them, so they were just kind of like their base class, which is, it's like fine, but it's not really fine. And then I learned just what you can do with Corn and how Corn is like a resource for other units where they provide like heart seals, like to heart seal into for other units or uh, what's it called, partner seals or um, friendship seals options for people. And my mind just kind of exploded into how many things you can do with Corrin. And it's kind of hard for me to tier a unit based off of both their own advantages as well as what they give to other units. But for what I can see, at least the general consensus is that Corrin is just good enough to be an S tier. And there were definitely points in my lunatic playthrough, my last lunatic playthrough, where Corrin was actually better than everyone else. Um, that I think is worthy of considering S tier. So, um, do you think Corn belongs in S, S tier? Uh, I don't disagree with anything you said. I, I sometimes go back and forth on whether I consider Corn to be like the last member of S tier or the very best person in A tier. Mm -hmm. um, because, and, and the only reason I wouldn't put put them in S tier is based on their starting class and and how they just fit into the flow of the game there's there are some limitations you have if you don't reclass Corrin very quickly um like not having a ranged weapon until the kodachi is kind of a drag mm -hmm. um so th which is a drop you get in chapter 12 um it, it's which you can avoid that for sure like if you if you become a ninja or a mage or, or a wyvern rider very early on, then you get other weapons that you can use. Um, but that means you are you know, spending stuff on corn that could go to improving other people as well. And there's a whole... There's tons of people in this game who can be dramatically improved by like one heart seal. And corn is a pretty good candidate for that, but 
I don't know. Sometimes I feel that if you've got to train up this unit from from level one and um, you know dump some of those limited resources into them, maybe they don't deserve to be in the S tier. But corn is really, really good. Um, and like you said, there's uh, they have a huge impact on on the campaign, both because of um, what they can do by themselves and all the the unique bonuses they can get from their 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 retainers, um, like Felicia and Jacob with their personal skills early on, and then if, eventually probably you want to rely on Gunter's um, for the damage and accuracy bonus. Um, there's there's several things that maybe Corn isn't the absolute best you can ever get at, um, but they're really good at the job. Mm -hmm. Like. Um, that feels very different from what Robin is then, right? From Awakening, where Robin can do everything is probably the best at any particular job, but Korn is just like not as good, but still very good at each of the Yeah, it's like I think it's a slight step down, but only a little bit in terms of like their competency at, at every role in the game. Um for example, I I usually like making Korn a uh, a mage. I like taking the magic boon. Um, because I, I think it's it really does make them shine early on with the Dragonstone without having to really invest a lot of special resources into them. And it transitions into some really, really powerful stuff later on, like becoming a Malignite, which is basically the best class you can be if you have the the stats for it. And you can, you can argue that maybe um, there are a couple other characters who are better at that from either the, the physical side or the magical side if you really try, but Corn does everything about it really well. Yeah, she could do. Um, uh, I, I was saying, see, uh, I'm pretty sure both male and female Corn can do it. Uh, but I feel like Corn can do both the magical and the physical side of that. Can it at once, maybe even? Yeah. If they want to? Yeah. And and maybe like on each side, they may be a step down from the absolute best, but you can do both. And that's that has value in its own way. Um, then there are other, there's other stuff like Ninja Corn is really, really strong if you go with a strength build. Um, there's also some wacky things you can do with replicate if you if you want. Oh yeah, I've done that. Where you like make a uh, ninja town corn and then marry Jacob or something. They have like four yeah. people. Yeah, something along those lines. I've I, maybe we'll talk about that more when we get to Jacob at some point because mm -hmm. it is a strategy that I, I I know people talk about a lot. I'm not as big a believer as as many people are, but it, it's it's pretty cool. Um. Do you think it's fair but, to give Corrin credit for all the things they do for other people, like with the the, um, the ceiling? Yeah, to a degree. Um, although I, it's never really necessary um, to to beat the game, of course. Uh, like Corrin's heart seal choice is a little bit funny because, for the most part, it's. Uh, you don't need to use a heart seal on corn because they also have access to all the friendship classes from everyone of the same gender. Mm -hmm. um, although there are some some interesting interesting things about that 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 do make for meaningful differences between male corn and female corn. Uh, because, for example, uh, female corn gets to have a fast support with Camilla. So if you start working on that as soon as Camilla joins, then it only takes chapter 10, 11, 12, and 13 to finish that support. And after chapter 13, which conveniently is when the second shop opens and you get more seals, uh, female corn can already become a wyvern rider without having to devote one of the one of the two early heart seals to her. Um, so that's pretty nice. Um, conversely, male corn has is the only one who can get ninja by friendship because there's the only ninja you get is is Kaze, the only person whose base class is ninja anyway. Uh, so if, like, maybe you want to do something else early on, like maybe you want to take Wyvern talent early, but then become a master ninja later in the game, well then, if you're trying to do that route, you have to go with Malecorn. Um, and I, I think it works out so that they're basically about equal, um, even though there are some substantial differences in, in the kinds of class paths you might choose, depending on whether you're male or female. Mm-hmm. But they're all, in the end, it's just personal preference then. Or just maybe, maybe not personal Mostly, preference, but or, like team composition maybe is a better word. Yeah, for like looking at what you want to do with your run, that, that really matters. Um, and that does affect um, Felicia and Jacob 
too, obviously. Yeah. Uh, because it, it changes their recruitment order. Um, I know for a long time the consensus was that Jacob was just outright better. Um, but the funny thing about that is I know at least for, for ETC, I'm pretty sure the conclusion now is Felicia is better than Jacob mm -hmm. just because uh, she's m more consistent at helping Corrin hit some of the really early uh, stat benchmarks that that he needs. Yeah, that matters a lot for ETC because that's uh, expected turn count where you're kind of mathematically calculating the best or the, the most likely lowest turn count clears. It's the best way I can yeah. sum it up, I think. Yeah, you're basically saying like you're you're and it, if you're aiming for say a five turn clear, you have to account for the fact that you might miss yeah. or otherwise like fail it, and then that takes an extra turn, and you have to weigh that in. Is like you know, you've got maybe eighty percent chance of five and a twenty percent chance of six turns, so you have to to do the math on that. Yeah, and it turns out that Felicia can hit reliably more often off or get slightly higher reliability to the point where her expected turn count is lower, basically. Yeah. Which is cool, yeah. I've, I've always found Felicia a little harder to use, but I'm, I'm sure that if you have the right planning, then you can definitely make up for any deficiencies that she has compared to Jacob and actually take advantage of what she has over him. But again, we'll probably get to that when we get to the actual servants. Mm -hmm. uh, but for now, I guess we could just like throw them into S tier. I, I, the, the way I've yeah. seen it is that if they're both roughly equal, there's no point in like moving them around either way, but I can't put them at the same place in this tier list maker, unfortunately. I guess I can uh -huh. move one of them off there, but whatever. Um, yeah, like, uh, and I I don't object to being an S tier. I mm -hmm. think it's just a matter of like where each person draws a line because like between what's S and what's A, and I I think it's perfectly reasonable to say yeah, let's put corn in S. Yeah, uh, there was one quick nitpick I wanted to say. Oh yeah, the, um, you mentioned that you have to train them up from level one, uh, but corn does have like a bunch of free chapters where you can almost yeah, exclusively it's, it's, train corn. It's really not that much of a burden, um, especially like. Because of the way the the branch of fate works, um, yeah, you don't have to, you don't even have to do it necessarily when you're playing the game. Yeah, I mean, you can even if you really want to, you could even like play that several times and get the get a coin with great growths and just use that for every run forever from now on. Oh, true. And then they'll just be automatically better for whatever playthroughs you do in the future. Um, yeah, that's that, that's basically saying though you only have to rig once and you can do it, but. I feel like rigging is kind of outside basically of the yeah anyway. but i <laughs> it feels more organic in this game than in other <laughs> true cases. it's not it's not like i'm like just holding <laughs> on to a save from like chapter three because I, I rigged the first three chapters it's like well i just have this menu button on the on the on the on the game that says start a new game with <laughs> the old corn i had if you don't okay. tell anyone they will never know it's rigged yeah fair enough all right, so we'll do it here. And if there's anything looking super off at the end of it, maybe we can always switch them around. But I feel like Corrin sure. can probably stay where you, where they are in, in yeah. S. Which, by the way, in case you, you didn't notice, this is not the most serious list ever. Like, don't worry. <laughs> if, if it looks slightly wrong, that's fine. That's that's what a tier list is supposed to look like. It's it's not... Yeah, I, I don't think, especially for this game, that a, a, a tier list can ever really be a, a mm -hmm. definitive account of who's good and who's not, or who you should use. Yeah. And it's... It, it's so difficult to to really distinguish units in objective terms in this game. Yeah, you can go on vibes sort of, and you can tell that maybe one unit is, you know, a little bit less resource intensive than another. But for the most part, you can make like two units who look very different. You can jam them into the same roles and yeah. make them do the same things if you really want to. Yeah, I feel like that's the concept of a lot of videos made in Conquest. Is like I I can make this person do this person's role. Yeah. Actually, if you don't mind, can we go on a tangent about that? Um, sure, I love tangents. For just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Because um, I, I do know some some good examples for that. Um, and one of them is, uh, we don't have him on, on the list to, to go right now, but um, Kaze, I think, is usually considered a pretty good unit in this game um, by most people. Uh, he doesn't do everything well, but the things he does do well, he's great at. Mm -hmm. um, and that's mainly fighting mages. He's just really well suited to that with his weapon triangle advantage and, and good res and, and dagger access and everything. Um, and occasionally like other kind of frailer physical units like Falcon Knights and Kenshi Knights. Um, so one of the best places to use him, which is which I featured in, in one of my videos, one of my, uh, specifically it was uh, beating chapter 20 the easy way. The Fuga's uh, Chapter 20. What was that? Fuga? 
right? Yeah, yeah. Chapter 20 is the, the Fuga map, the wind map. And one of the recommendations I made there was like the really difficult part of that map, assuming you're not skipping straight to the boss, is uh, the mini boss Hayato, who has a hexing rod and is just really annoying to deal with if you have to like, try to navigate around him. So I recommend just doing what it takes to uh, pair a, a unit who can fight him and all the people around him with a flyer and have them just drop him right next to him and and uh, start attacking him right away to get rid of him. And so what that and what I used in that video was Kaze because the other units around Hayato Hayato himself is a mage and the other units around him are some Onmyojis, the like sages and falcon knights so he can handle that really well because he's just super well equipped for it you can give him a hunter's knife and he can one round all the generic enemies um, and one of the, the key things that makes that pretty safe is that kaze doubles everyone he has uh at roughly the level where you'd expect to be at that point in the game if you were just on the level curve which is around being uh level 25 so in Kaze's case, I'd be level, raise him to level 20 and then promote him and raise him to level 5 from there, yep. or some equivalent to that. Uh, he would have about 30 speed, and it takes 30 exactly to double the Falcon Knights. Yeah, and this is before all the stacking you can do. Yeah, he just has it naturally. Um, so he's really well suited to that. And you can compare him to someone else who's generally considered a lot worse, like Flora. Um, when you recruit Flora, she's actually, if you recruit her as early as possible, that's right after chapter 18. Um, she has basically the same stat line as that Kaze would, uh, like almost identical strength, defense, HP, resistance, uh, skill and everything. Except instead of having 30 speed, she has 15. <laughs> so instead of doubling everything, she's uh, getting doubled by <laughs> most things. However, you can just fix that in this game. There's enough sources of speed to just race her right back to 30 herself. You can do Rally Speed, that's four. Lazo's Rally is another point. Uh, inspiring Song from Azura is plus three. Uh, plus two from a Tonic, plus two more from a Meal, that's 12 total. And then you tack on a generic Berserker or Falcon Knight pair up, that's plus three. Plus 15, you're there. So. Is it objectively true that Kaze can do something on that map that Flora can't? I guess not really. Um, but you can look at that situation and say, well, definitely Flora takes a lot more work and we should punish her for that. But that's part of why it's so difficult to say that like X unit is better than Y unit, absolutely, because maybe they're better on paper but it doesn't actually matter in practice and so you can do the same things with both of them yeah which i feel like almost makes corin's position here uh even make more make even more sense because they can do anything on paper so they can be easily yeah to any role. and and generally they don't lack for stats either like there's there's not really such a thing as a no investment unit in this game although maybe there's one person who comes close mm -hmm. um like you're always going to try to to pile on those resources to help people hit those stat benchmarks and succeed at whatever you're trying to make them do. But um, in Corin's case, whatever you're going to make them into, uh, there's like their, their stats, assuming you picked a, like, even a remotely sensible boon and bane combination, their stats are going to be basically where they need to be with just some minor tweaks. Um, you know, give them the right para partner or maybe give them a tonic or something. And that's really nice. It's very convenient. For sure. I, I feel like the hardest part with Corn for me is when I start a playthrough and I have no idea what I want to do with Corn. It's like, uh, where do I even sure. start? Yeah, that's, that's the hardest part to overcome with her. Everything else I, is fine. I think for me, mo mostly that's driven by what other unit do I want to show a lot of favoritism to now? Yeah. Partly because, like I said earlier, your Heart Seal maybe doesn't matter. Heart Seal choice doesn't really matter that much for Corn because. Even if you don't pick a good one for them, they can get other good classes by friendship relatively quickly. Um, so I, I tend to think of it nowadays more as I, I want to give this special resource to a particular unit that I want to uh, 
I want to, to give favoritism to. True. <clears throat> okay. Uh, any concluding thoughts about Corrin? Shall we move on to uh, someone else? Uh, no, I think that's about it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, okay, I lied. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's fair. You can lie on this. I, since we didn't really talk about it, like I was, we were mostly discussing Corrin as a as a kind of unit who who does a lot of combat. But it it bears mentioning that their personal skill makes them really really good at supporting other units too. Mm -hmm. um, so there are good reasons to to uh, like even if Corrin's not your main combat unit or one of your primary combat units there's uh there's good reasons to deploy them anyway and in addition to giving a special class to someone uh supportive makes them really really good at as a support unit uh real exactly it's like if you have a c or higher you give some amount of stats while you're supporting yeah if someone. you have as long as you have any support rank at all um and corn is the supporting unit in battle so it's not just enough to be adjacent, unlike some other personal skills. They have to be the person who's either dual striking or paired up mm -hmm. with the lead unit. Um, but it, if in the battle, Corrin is the support unit, then the lead unit gets two extra damage, they take two less damage, and they get plus 10 hit. And honestly, I think my favorite part of that is the plus 10 hit. It's surprisingly useful. Yeah, especially because it also stacks with the dual striking plus 10 hit and like any other support bonuses you have, right? Yeah, it can. That's pretty busted. I do like that about Corn as well. Even in the early game, it's just so nice to have some reliability yeah. on some people that mm -hmm. used to hit the broad side of the barn, like, I don't know, Artur or even Effie sometimes. Yeah. And Corn is also just, like, very flexible in that role because you can just give her a Dragonstone. She'll never die to anything in the early game unless you're really, really trying. It makes it easier to get in range of uh, power friendship or size as well. Yeah, it's, it's part of why I like um, the magic-oriented Corrin setup because you can use the Dragonstone more and uh, and have Corrin act a bit more independently and, and have big dual strikes and, and use supportive on a bunch of other people around them. Yeah, it's all around super versatile, even like beyond the whole heart seal shenanigans for sure. Mm -hmm. Like a lot too. It just it just gives me the decision paralysis. But if you have a plan in mind, then they'll probably be able to execute it. All right, so maybe we can move on to the least flexible unit in the game, <laughs> Azora, with regards to what role you put her. Oh, I guess I guess you do have other options for her. It's just the the, the dancing thing. It's just too they're, good. They're bad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're they're funny. Yeah. They're funny. Bad. Yes, they're they're funny, but it's it's such a drag mm -hmm. to not have Azura and Songstress. I I don't recommend that to anyone ever. For sure, it's. I feel like Azora. I don't remember exactly where I put her on my dancer tier list, but. I wouldn't be surprised if I had her as the highest dancer in the series because the option to shelter sing, it's, I think it's only paralleled by like the quadruple dances you have in some games. It's absurd that you can just dance multiple times with just the right amount of people with shelter in this game. Yeah, it, it's pretty ridiculous. Um, I don't feel qualified to make a judgment about her relative to all the dancers in the series because I haven't played like half the games. Um, but I have it on good authority from Septi that she's probably the best too. So. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, if if you don't realize what Shelter can do in conjunction with Azura, then she's still really amazing if you're just singing once per turn, but as you figure out that mechanic and you start using it more and more, it's amazing what what you can pull off with, with Azura's help. And it's... So many things in the game become so much easier if you're just able to set that up and I don't know what more to say <laughs> uh, I feel like it's a little bit tricky to use sometimes especially when you have tight cramped corridors and you end oh, up with a yeah. bunch of people paired up with each other that you need to get unpaired so they can do it again like it does require a bit of maintenance so you can keep doing it turn after turn which is yeah it's, it's not like it's not free in terms of action economy either um, I mean Azura herself only exchanges her turn one for one and then if you are doing the shelter singing maneuvers I mean the first one costs you someone to shelter and then someone else to to take her and then beyond that you need three units because you have to separate her from um, the person who took her from the shelter in the first place then you have to shelter her again and then you have to pull her again so um, 
there's there's some, there's some setup that goes into it, and you're right. It is really awkward in some places where there's you know, cramped quarters, and you ju just don't have room to do all that. Um, but it's worth it, so you do it anyway. Like yes. this game just rewards really big pushes like that every now and then. Yeah. Um, there's there's just so much power you can get out of you know double moving multiple characters um, in one turn. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's also important to emphasize that Azorus is also a big part of the stat stacking things you can do in this game because of Inspiring Song, right? That's the that's the plus three staff thing, right? Yeah, she is. Um, yeah, the plus three speed is is often helpful. Uh, the plus six hit, also pretty useful. Uh, it's n I, I almost always uh, really appreciate it when I see it. It's it's one of those things where you don't really like it's you take it for granted when you have it when you don't have it you suddenly start missing a lot more it feels like because yeah it's plus three decks what is the last that it gives again luck no right yeah it's, so it's it's in this game it's still called skill but oh, confusingly yeah. but it's uh but it's plus three skill plus three speed plus three luck so the and in this game skill is um it's one and a half times skill plus half your luck oh yeah um i always mess up the formula somehow we, yeah I mean, it keeps changing every game, basically. Uh, but yeah, in this game and in Awakening, uh, it's one and a half skill plus half luck for, for hit. So if you have three and three, that's four and a half plus one and a half, so mm -hmm. six. But yeah, like you said earlier, it's one of the things that allows you to do something like having Flora replicate Kaze's role, even though Kaze has doubled their speed, because plus yeah. three speed for free is so nice. Although. I was just reminded in that chapter, you do don't you need your flyer to get danced by um, Azura to get to the place you wanted to go? You um, yes, but shelter thing with, with the power of shelter singing, it's it's awkward, but you can make that maneuver happen if you mm -hmm. want to. Um, like, I think I even mentioned having like rally speed and a Falcon Knight. I mean, you could make and a Falcon Knight as a pair up partner. You could you could have the Falcon Knight rally and sing for them and still manage to also sing for Flora and have Flora pair up with the Falcon Knight and then have them fly together. So many options um, when you have a giant block of units deployed at the start of the chapter and they're just yeah, there to assist this doing, little maneuver. Yeah, if you're doing that kind of thing on turn one, it's you know, it's it's a puzzle to figure out, but it's doable. Mm -hmm. Right, in uh, S tier we'll go. Uh, above Corrin, I feel like is reasonable. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I... Yeah, there's, there's no world where corn is a better is a better more important unit than, than azura mm -hmm. I think. for sure also just like most units are going to have that problem that i don't know if we mentioned it on camera where what's good or not and like what resources for you or not depends on your team composition but azura is good in any team any chapter no matter what you're doing yeah that adds a bit to it yeah believe me on in the the train everyone challenge i'm doing because my deployment is so tight there's a bunch of chapters where i can't deploy azura and i miss her every time <laughs> That's her. All right. Um, Camilla, I, I feel like the edges, the upper edges, especially of most tier lists, are very uncontroversial because the units that are very, 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 very good, it's also very, very obvious that they're so, whereas the middle get a lot more, gets a bit more hazy. Um, but with Camilla, I feel like almost everyone can agree this is absolutely fantastic, bonker, super good. Uh, in my initial tier list, I'm pretty sure I didn't have her as the highest unit. I had Xander and Corrin above Camilla before, and I don't know what I was thinking back then. And I was just reminded, I think there's, there's, I think it's chapter 10 of your, your playthrough. Um, I think you mentioned something like, Camilla's the best unit in the game, it's not even close. I was like, well, well, that's embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> well, I, the, the joke I like to say about chapter 10 is Camilla's bad in that map because she doesn't have time to, to participate. She, she joins too late. Um, but that's just me flexing. <laughs> uh, yeah, she's absolutely amazing. Um, and I, I, I think I hinted before that there's like, maybe one unit who's clearly better at everything than everyone else, and that's that's Camilla. <laughs> um, it's just it's, the stats at her drawing time, basically, right? And a class, I guess. It's not just that. Although, if she, if she had her stats at her join time, um, and didn't have a low internal level, I think she still might be the contender for best unit in the game. Um, Oh, you but think that's really on top though, of right? that, on top of that, she gets to, she gets to be treated like she promoted at level ten or eleven, um, which still means when she first joins, she gets almost no experience, 
Yeah. But pretty quickly, she starts leveling up normally. And then you get to like the late middle part of the game and you realize, wow, Camilla is has way better stats than everyone and she's leveling up faster than everyone. Yeah, and it it's, snowballs because like, she also kills things so quickly. Yeah, like her, her stats are incredible. Her like growth distribution, amazing. Um, her only kind of notable weakness is, I mean, I guess there's two. One is she doesn't have the greatest luck, so you, you but it's not so bad that you can't mostly rectify that with just like the plus five dodge you get from pairing up. Um, there aren't that many enemies who have significant crit chances on her. Does Luck Tonic give four luck in this game as well? Luck Tonic gives four luck, although that is only two crit avoid. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's also worth considering too. I mean, if you're facing one or two percent crit rate, yeah, get a Luck Tonic. Um, where was I? Um, she has two weaknesses. One of them is a little luck. Oh yeah, yeah, and the the other one is like her magic isn't that impressive, and you kind of wish it was because then she would just do everything really well. But I mean, if you if you want to, you can fix that too. Um, whether that's with uh, like a sorcerer or pair up partner, or Dark Knight, maybe Odin, um, or giving her a bunch of the spirit dust, which there are five of in this game. True. Uh, like there is competition, but again, this is just something you can do with one unit, and it could be Camilla. Yeah, and it's it's far from necessary. Like you don't mm -hmm. you don't really have to give Camilla much of any of your consumable resources to make her a dominant force for basically the whole game. Mm -hmm. But it's, but the fun part is when you do give her like even the little thing, it still makes such a massive difference. I found because I remember. Uh, when I was doing my playthrough with, with Quimbush, my lunatic playthrough, we gave a bunch of shit to Camilla, and like every one mm -hmm. of them compounded her the ability to just juggernaut through things by so much. Because, for example, fate units have such low HP, generally speaking, but if you give Camilla like uh, an HP stat booster, that's like if you go from being 8 hit KO'd to getting like, what is it, like 15 hit KO'd or something like that, that's still such a big difference maker. Yeah, but absolutely. She, <laughs> um, like maybe the, the marginal benefit of that isn't that huge but it's still very noticeable on her and like there's no reason not to make her one of your main combat units and she carries almost every chapter of uh, basically <laughs> me like trying to think through like if, if you just kept camilla and malignite and you did nothing special with her i think mm -hmm. maybe the first map where she's not that good is the kitsune map just because of accuracy concerns. Is the bow mm. weakness never that much of an issue? I remember having trouble with like shrine maidens and stuff whenever I was trying to use Camilla late game. Like not that, um, not that she's bad there, but that's like one obstacle I would sometimes run into is being weak to bows. With the yeah, the, with the priestesses in particular. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're 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 an obstacle. Uh, Although, to be fair, I do also remember like most. Uh, enemy formations would have like one or two bow users to try and stop you from doing anything. So what we would do is freeze one bow user and kill the other one with Camilla, and then you're home free. Yeah, that's basically how it goes. Um, I'm I'm just trying to think through some of the later game maps that have bow units. There's like the the wind map. There's a couple of stationary priestesses who have Han Qs, the the one two range. Yeah, those are really annoying. So it's, so it's not it's not really ever safe for Camilla to attack those. Um, but they also don't move, so just don't have Camilla fight them. Uh, but I think maybe the most obviously bow-heavy map is Takumi's map, the Great Wall map. Uh, and even there, like, if you want to go up on the Great Wall, there is actually like one, one square you can fly to from the stairs you have to take, where you can stop and none of the archers can reach you. <laughs> And and you can sit there and kill like all the masters of arms and spear masters and basaras and everything. Uh, so yeah, the like enemy snipers are kind of a threat, but you can just like you said, there's lots of ways to neutralize them. They're they're not there's not that much density to deal with. Um, unlike awakening, enemy mages don't have a ton of wind magic, uh, so. You can play around the, the few things that can seriously threaten Camilla. And even on the maps that have a lot of snipers, there's there's places you can go where they just don't matter anymore. 
Yeah, and this is all assuming that you keep her as a Malignite, but you don't have yeah, to keep her as a Malignite. Like, you can reclass to, I don't know, we did Bow Knight on one playthrough, we got a luck touch on Camilla for some dumb reason. And, and move yeah, plus one, of course. And, I can see uh, that being pretty fun. <laughs> Um, and of course, I gotta mention Septi's uh, hold Camilla forward as a maid playthrough. Yep. Yeah, it's maybe the dumbest way to play. Just, it's. Yeah. Um, she's incredible at mm -hmm. that. And. Uh, and Rose's Thorns exists to give yeah, you more damage she, like, if you want to. Yeah. Ro Rose's Thorns is like the cherry on top because it's like. Even if you don't want to abuse the. The, the the promoted wyvern rider you get in like the i guess it's the fifth chapter of the route proper yeah you're counting six seven eight nine um even if you don't want to abuse your pre-promoted wyvern rider um who has incredible stats and is actually not going to be behind the the level curve and has full supports with everyone yeah, just about let's say you want to flex you don't all want to do that for some reason right yeah yeah if, if, if you want to focus on training your other teammates, she's incredible at helping with that, too. Um, because she has Rose's Thorns for that aura utility, and she sets up kills beautifully if you want her to do that. It's it's like the full package. It's like everything you could possibly want from a pre-promote. And she's not even really restricted on experience the way many other pre-promotes are. She, gets, she grows better and faster than mm -hmm. just about everyone. Yeah, it's great. And, I mean, we already kind of already said that she's the best unit in the game, barring none, so above Azura, which, I, I don't know, Azura feels like she's so good that she makes everyone go again, even Camilla, but I generally feel like it's the good practice in tier list to put units that are so good that they want to get danced a lot ahead of the dancer, because they enable each other to be good in a way. Like, trading Azura's to you turn for another turn of Camilla's is so good, but Camilla's doing most of the weightlifting, I feel like, if you're doing that. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think on some level, you have to reward the fact that Camilla is the one actually doing the yeah. things that are important to beat the map. Like, Azura lets you do them faster, but you have to actually be able to accomplish the tasks, right? And Azura's, I mean, it's fate, so you can make Azura your main combat unit if you want to, yeah. but don't. Uh, and Camilla's just really well suited to, mm -hmm. to yeah. doing that. The one argument um, against I, it... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, I was just going to say, the one argument against that you could make is, you know, the whole substitution theory. You could leave out Azura and you would still have Camilla and vice versa. You know, if you substitute Camilla for someone else, you're going to get worse combat, but you still have your Dancer, which, like you said earlier, is like a huge difference maker when you're playing a map, whereas replacing Camilla with the next worst unit, I don't know how big of a difference that is. In Chapter 10, it's huge, but it's, it's going to go down as the game goes on, right? Like in Chapter... 20 something substituting for Camilla for your next best unit is not going to be that big of a difference maker, right? Sure, that's true. Um but to 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 make the kind of unit who can replace Camilla, it takes a pretty shocking amount of work. Um it's not not doable. Um in fact, one of the things that I think is difficult about rating people on a tier list like this by say an LTC metric mm -hmm. is I think generally the the obvious and probably correct thing to do in an LTC of this game is to rely mainly on Camilla for almost all of your combat purposes, have her kill almost all the bosses and everything. But I'm pretty confident that you could swap her out with someone else to do like be your, your main Wyvern Rider and do all that stuff and and make it work without even necessarily losing any turns. Like I don't know this for a fact, but I, I wouldn't be shocked if even like Arthur could do that. Um, you would still need Camilla probably for the first few chapters after she joins, but you could, there's a lot of dead time in, in some of those chapters or like opportunities to go fight some other side groups where you can do some training. And it wouldn't shock me if you could devote that experience and training to Arthur and give him some combination of like corn marriage and maybe Niall's friendship and work through those class paths and come out with a, a wyvern lord with nine movement who can do the th same things that Camilla can. So like, mm -hmm. 
I, I'd, I'd like to see that actually. I think it'd be yeah. cool if someone pulled that off. <laughs> I'd, um, I, I think it would be an interesting experiment because I would like to see how many turns you would lose. Not that I'm super concerned about exactly how many turns it would cost, but I would just like to see how far off it is from just the Mao Camilla. Yeah, I, I think if I had to guess, I would be dead certain that it would cost you like fewer than six turns. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say single digit. I, I think there's very good chances that it maybe cost you like only one or two and there's a small chance that it doesn't cost you any yeah i feel like um, and it, sorry depending ahead. on what you depending on what you demand for things like reliability like yeah maybe there are two there are cases where you need arthur to try to abuse his personal skill and swing a killer axe and get like <laughs> a 40 percent crit rate to make the the turn count work but you know theoretically he can do it right yeah for sure. There was actually one, that's actually a very interesting point that I wanted to tangent into real a little bit. I mean, we only have one unit left anyway. Um, for now, for now, this is going to be yeah. a multi-part thing. Um, so the real cost is not in turn count probably, or even that it's possible to, to beat the game within like some kind of efficient metric. I feel like the real cost to making people good outside of resource management too, is like planning and, and time to plan yes. things. because. That's, I think, one of the hardest parts of this game to crack, and maybe even the real cost behind having to use worse units at a job that someone else can do better. Because, for example, I know you play Chapter 10 one, this one time. I know this doesn't really narrow it down, but trust me. Uh, where I think you used, like, Mozu in her base class and had her get, like, a bunch of kills there and still, like, yeah, be tough. Yeah, I was the 0% one, I, I Yeah, think. the 0% Pretty too, sure. yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you can totally do that in the same amount of turns with the same amount of training objectives probably but how many how long did you sit behind your emulator in a spreadsheet trying to figure it out though um you know as i recall that one wasn't that bad um probably a couple days playing around with with uh you know save states and stuff to try mm -hmm. to, to plan that out um it probably gets I, easier the more you I, do it too true yeah um for zero percent in particular, I've I've never felt like that's a very good lens for for viewing like unit performance or judging mm -hmm. how things go on a tier list like this. I it's agree. just it's so artificial um, and and unrealistic. Um, but it is it's kind of a funny exercise. Uh, yeah, but that one in particular wasn't that bad, but I think largely it's because I, I basically know by heart like what you need to be able to do things on on chapter 10 so i think the 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 difficult part was working out like how exactly i could i could feed that kill to mozu and nix which i thought was was going to be really funny and it was mm -hmm. um to, like to have them kill takami at the end mm -hmm. um but you're right that like the real cost between uh, a a unit who's obviously good like camilla and some of the the people who i think we're going to rate lower down who can theoretically do the same things that she does is going to be some kind of time investment whether that's on the macro level planning out how exactly they're going to get through the classes they want to go through and get their skills and um, build, build support ranks uh, and generally find opportunities to train themselves um, and then also on the tactical level when you're playing the actual maps executing on that and like taking that example with flora like doing all the right maneuvers with with azura to make sure that everyone gets the right um gets uh, everyone gets sung to at the right moment yes. and they can all like you, you can execute all that and then combine people and send them to the right spot like it, it's doable but there is a there is a real cost to that yeah um we only have so much time on this earth we don't we might want to minimize the amount of time we spent it trying to get azura to the right places yes Basically, I'm, I'm glad you agree because that's the that's the one thing um, that I was wondering about with regards to because uh, it's, it's basically another slider of uh, how strict what you want to judge people on. Like, do you want to judge based on reliability, how many turns they save, or you know how much time it takes to make them good, whether that's planning time uh, or or training time. Mm -hmm. So, all right, um, but. Yeah, we were we were talking about Camilla at one point. Yes. Um, but I think we I think we're done with Camilla though. I think we're we've uh, solidified it. Unless there's yeah, something I, left. Yeah, I think. Yeah, the, the one other thing I would say about her is, um, like there, there's one 
big obstacle at the very end of the game where you you have to kill Takumi, mm -hmm. and um, Camilla is a huge help for that too, uh, depending on your approach. Uh, partly because she has Rose's Thorns, so if you're gonna do uh, one of the kind of slower, maybe two turn setups to beat end game, if you're, I'm assuming probably that you're gonna try to skip end game. I I do think it's easier than people realize to play that map more or less straight up, but it's. I would still recommend that you just skip it. It's, it should um, definitely be part of this course here for sure. Yeah, the option to skip it, um, and it's it's it probably cuts down on planning time, like we just talked about. Yeah, I I think in that that's one of the maps where I think it's easier to take the time to figure out. Okay, in my campaign, who am I going to set up to beat the final boss? Yes. Than to play out the map and try to figure that out on the fly. Um. um but Camilla helps because she can help you hit the the kill threshold with with Rose's Thorns for one thing. Um, if you just maneuver her down there to be next to Takumi, um, and she can do the kill herself too. Uh, she has access to, like, as a Wyvern Rider, a Malignite, she has access to like plus seven damage just from her native class with Strength plus two and Trample. And she can um, she has friendship with Baruka that gives her Berserker. So if you want to, you can send her that way and pick up Axe Fair as well. Um, and if you... She's not probably naturally going to gain enough strength to get to the kill threshold, but you can feed her some energy drops and then she'll probably get there. Um, so she can be the person who kills Takumi for you too. Mm -hmm. And that's worth noting, I think. Yeah. I think maybe it would have been good to mention it during Corn as well, obviously, because they have the all these Yatsu options. Yeah, true. The Taku um, kill is a big yeah. deal for sure. It, it is, yeah. And yeah, yeah we, I think it's not too late to say. <laughs> it's not too late. Corn, Corn, They're still watching. Corn does have, have, have the Yato, and that is the that is the weapon that requires the the least absolute stats to, to kill Takumi. Um, depending on what kind of boon and bane you pick, it may not be very convenient to to get corn to the point where they're beating Takumi with the Yato 100% consistently, like without Dragon Fang. Um, it's kind of annoying, actually, that the the best, for the, for this purpose, the best sword class is Great Knight of all things, which doesn't even yeah. have more than B rank in, in swords. Well, hey, that just feels kind of lame to me. At least you get Luna out uh, of it. Yeah. Um, although Luna barely helps. I think it does like three extra damage against Takumi if it procs. Uh, it's been a while since I tried it. I just remember we did Great Knight Corn for our end game. Yeah. Um, but that's your best bet. Um, I I think in general there are easier options than both Corn and Camilla, unless you're specifically doing plus strength Corn, in which case, yeah, probably just have them yeah. swing the Yaku and do it. Just an extra thing on their CV, on like an already yeah. impressive CV nonetheless. But you know, mm -hmm. what better thing to yeah, talk about at the, at the end? It, than... it, it's great that you don't have to really deviate from the, the very best units in the game to to solve the the last map. <laughs> to you beat the actual game. Yes, <laughs> yeah. it is a it's a pretty big stat threshold you have to hit for sure. Um, but yeah, that helps for sure. Uh, all right, so shall we move on to Xander then? Sure. Yeah. So I had Xander at the very top because I felt like he was the most brainless way to get through Conquest. Like a lot of the maps, especially late game Conquests, feel so daunting with the stat benchmarks that you have to face. Like there's just a big difficulty spike, I think around chapter 20, where some of the units that were doing fine before just start doing absolutely awful, both on offense and defense. And I don't remember my Xander doubling or anything, but he did survive everything. So it just ended up being everyone hides behind Xander. And now that I know a bit more about the game, and I know that you can make Xander double things by just stacking a bunch of speed onto him or giving him a good pair partner uh, or anything like that. I feel like Xander is still one of the easiest units to make good. So I'm tempted to still keep him in S tier. But at the same time, I do realize that he has limitations. Particularly, he just has a lot less availability than all the units that are currently in S tier. But he still stands out so much when you get him to me, especially on his joining map, but even maps thereafter. And I feel like an S tier would be warranted. Like it's, it's for, for one thing, for all the units that we have mentioned, it's pretty uncommon for them to have good one to range that you don't have to work very hard for. Like he just has it at base. And the it, the amount of things that Secret just gives you for free, like the plus four defense, I think is what it is. And yeah, then the high four. might. 
and one two range with no like it even drawback. has a dodge bonus yeah i know that too like he's he's even better against berserkers than camilla in so many ways so yeah i don't know he's just so absurd that i feel like it's warranted putting him up there uh, i don't think he's the best anymore necessarily but i feel like he puts up a fight against corn and azura at the very least what do you think uh i think he does put up a fight um i think on the scale that i think we're trying to stretch across for conquest units i would push him down to a like if we're saying that we're going to put the worst units in d and we're we're, we're pretending that there are <laughs> units in Conquest who are actually bad, which I don't think there really are, uh -huh. then I do think that Xander, like on that mm -hmm. scale, Xander is a grade below. Mm -hmm. um, Camilla and Azura for sure. And I, th I think he's just a little bit behind Corin and maybe one other person, but I think behind by enough to say that I don't see him in S. Um, and partly it's because of the, the availability, as you mentioned. He... He is only around for the second half of the game. Um, but also, the more you... The more experience you are at the game, the less you need his defense. I feel like that's... Yeah, I mean, that, that's true. There, but there's other things that I, I think you realize are not as impressive as they first seem. Um, and one of them is Siegfried. Um, because, well, it's a sword, so you can't use it when you're flying, which has a significant limitation. Um, although you do still get the plus four defense bonus, which is kind of awesome. Um, but Siegfried is a its a sword. It has free one-two range. It has 11 might. That's pretty good. It only has 80 hit, which is really bad for a sword. Um, like, it's worse than a steel sword by five. Um, so it doesn't tend to become a problem, really, because Xander is so tanky that like if he fails kills let's try again it's, it's, he's not going to be punished really yeah um although th what this game does with its difficulties it, it mostly it it does hurt you when you like the number one thing to avoid all the the tricks that conquest lunatic will do to you is to just kill the enemies <laughs> and failing to kill them because you you miss is is one way that you can start getting Punished. Yeah, that's when like that's um, when people start getting in trouble with like the ninjas and seal skills, especially. That's yeah, see, there's seal skills that only come into play if you get, um, if you if they survive. Um, th things like lunging can pull you to the wrong spot, and they won't happen if you kill on the counterattack. That kind of stuff. Um, so like Xander is still really really strong because even even though like he's one of the people who can mess up and still not really get hurt by it because he's so tanky. And that makes him really friendly to new players, it, and he's really helpful for even experienced players too. Um, but I, I think if you if you consider that he's not around for the first half of the game, and even at the things that he's great at, he's not necessarily the best option in terms of like speed and reliability. Um, I think that knocks him down a peg. Um, I don't really want to jump ahead, but I, I think there's one other candidate for a unit who is very similar to, to Xander in terms of how dominant they can be and, and what they do in the game. Um, and I, I think kind of edges him out um, if, if you're just looking objectively at like what's, what's going to consistently... Um, solve some of the maps where you'd like to use Xander. Like Kitsune Lair, one of the 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 easy making Xander a Wyvern Lord is one of the easiest ways to finish that map, but it's also super slow and boring because he's so tanky that some of the enemies just don't even attack him. Mm -hmm. Um just kind of annoying. Yeah. I feel like that um, kind of thing is like a it's a good footnote and like a, a good example of how it trivializes the game, but it's not really the context we're trying to discuss then. But it's 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 yeah. good to note, I think. Like I, I, I would strongly recommend that any player use Xander like all the time. Mm -hmm. Any opportunity they, ha they yeah. have. Yeah, this is like a, a unit guide or a character guide or whatever. They always yeah. use him basically. Put him at the top. Yeah, um, but I think if you're if you're looking at like if you're playing the game pretty well and you understand all the mechanics, you start to realize that sometimes he's overkill on things and that makes him perform worse just because he's so bulky. 
And some of the unique things he had, like Siegfried, aren't actually as good as you'd hope they would be. Um, but don't get me wrong, like Xander's really amazing. I just think he's at least a, a noticeable step down from the, the S tiers. Mm -hmm. If I told you that, because if I wanted to integrate this in my big tier list, at some point I'll have to, I'll probably have to move the Conquest characters up a bit if I spread them across the D tier, because like you said, there might not be, like, we don't have to pretend that there's bad units in Conquest if you don't feel like there are. Like, if nobody's D tier, then nobody's D tier. It's that well, simple. I, I think in, in this, just in this limited context, it, it'd be useful to, to have a, a D tier. Mm -hmm. But... I think you're about to ask, like, would would I consider Xander to be in one of the S tiers yeah. on your big tier list? Yes, correct. Or something like that. And I would say, yeah, probably. <laughs> Fair enough. Based okay. based on what I remember from what else is up there. Yeah. Um, it's it's. Do you really have difficult. S? Is it S plus and S minus, or are there three up there? I or? think it was S plus and S minus, but I'd have to check at some point. But we can tentatively throw them in S for now. I just think. I'm not afraid to do things that are controversial, but I know there's a lot of people who would really consider it as an S tier would look at me like, dude, are you insane? You put him in A tier in a review? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think if we were considering an S minus tier um, in the big tier list, I think Xander would belong there. That's good. Um, but within just the, like what gradations we can give to the Conquest units, I would knock him down. But I would say he's definitely not in the same tier as Camilla. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think uh, this is something we can take a quick look again at when we're actually done with the list and we can see if he fits mm -hmm. better with the S tiers or the A tiers because I think I have an idea of who you have in mind for the last one, but uh, okay. I'm going to keep that one for the next one because we've been going for an hour already on these yeah. four units. Um, so that'll do for now, but these are not final positions. It's a tier list review. It'll, it'll, the review is done at the end, not the beginning. Ugh. Right. Cool. Well, that's uh, that's four units in, a, in an hour, plus some introing and, and rules setting and all that. But uh, So we only have nine more of these to go, right? Only so nine four, more of these to go. Well, I presume <laughs> that at some point there will be a bit of overlap between some units and their utilities. But at the same time, Conquest is very good at making units unique and we have child units to contend, contend with. So yeah, I don't know whether it's going to go up or down. But that, That'll be an interesting conversation. Mm -hmm. um, we'll, we'll have to talk more about how we even start to consider those but um yeah looking forward to it yeah same thank you so much for being on here zorn it's uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, yeah it's been a pleasure for me too all right we'll see you all next time bye bye bye